Reformed people have been universally renowned for being really wound up about getting theology right. I think that's what I've heard. We, we have this reputation for being supposedly, supposedly over picky about understanding biblical truth in a precise way. Maybe, maybe, maybe sometimes we get uptight about some really specific issues. Most of the time, though, the thing is, we usually have good intentions in defending the truth. We care deeply about everything in God's Word that it teaches, and we want to express it well. Our text tonight in Micah 2 gives us some insight into why, in fact, it is important to care deeply about the truth. Because the truth that we preach never stays at the theoretical level, but always, always has practical consequences. So before we dive into that, though, we need to review, see where we are. So we're working through Micah, right? He was a prophet who preached in the southern kingdom of Judea. Israel, split into two, the northern, the Israel, and then the southern kingdom, Judah. He worked under the kings Jotham, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah during the events recorded in 2 Kings 15 to 20, around the years 750 to 686 BC, if you like those bits. And as we read last week in 2 Kings 15, even when Jotham, a righteous king, reigned, there were still centers of pagan worship still established in the promised land. And the prophets were the covenant lawyers who brought God's charges against his sinful people. Micah was one of these prophets that prosecuted a vigorously disobedient people. And the book of Micah is a collection of inspired sermons which Micah delivered throughout his long career that the Spirit later inspired him again to bind together into this book that we have before us. We thought about how chapter 1 is two sermons directed against Samaria and Judah, and then the second one just against Judah, predicting their coming destruction. And we focused last time on what those sermons teach us about the doctrine of God. And so now we we come to this chapter 2, which is another prophetic indictment of the people. And now many people argue that there are three distinct uh, messages or three distinct sermons in this chapter, but what they didn't recognize is that there aren't three sermons. Micah was just a good Presbyterian. One sermon with three points. Sadly, we don't have his alliterated headings, but I'm sure he had them. In verses 1 to 5, Micah indicted the social elite who used their position to take advantage of those who had less than they did. In verses 6 to 11, Micah indicted preachers who taught half-truths or outright adjusted their theology to enable those who were controlling society for their own benefit. In other words, this chapter shows the reason why it was good and proper to focus on right theology in chapter 1. And then finally, in verses 12 and 13, even in the midst of all of this prediction of doom, Micah offered a small hope of deliverance concerning the approaching judgment that was coming in the form of foreign armies. And so the main point that we're going to think about tonight is that bad theology enables bad practice. Bad theology enables bad practice. And we're going to think about this in three points. The upcoming problems, the underlying premise and the undying promise. So first, the upcoming problems. In this point, what I, what I want to do is get a handle on what's actually going on 
in this text. Because I don't know that it, unless we stop and pause to think about it, some of it's not right there on the surface. And we're going to focus on the sections in verses 1 to 5 and then 6 to 11 that address the social elite and the corrupt preachers respectively. We, we need to remember one of my favorite things about this book. Chapters 1 to 3 is called the Book of Doom. And in this first section of Micah, it's devoted to announcing calamity upon the wicked. So read verses 1 and 2 with me. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. These verses give a description of the social elite who use their power to store up even more things for themselves by taking from others. We see that this is about the social elite in the, phrase, the last phrase of verse 1, because it is in the power of their hand. So it, it seems that these oppressors do their corrupt deeds not because they need more things or even have specific progress for themselves in mind, they do it simply because they want to foist their power on to people who are less powerful than they were. St. Augustine, one of the early church fathers, told a story in his confessions about stealing pears from a neighbor, neighbor's uh, land as a boy. And before you think that Harrison's just being a historian right now going after the early church, Augustine is new compared to Micah, so just remember that. But Augustine explained that he and his friends when he was a boy weren't hungry, and the pears didn't even look good. Look good. They, they were basically overripe on the tree. And yet, he still desired to steal them. Augustine wrote, we carried off a huge load of pears, not to eat ourselves, but to dump out to the hogs after barely tasting some of them ourselves. Doing this pleased us all the more because it was forbidden. Such was my heart, O God. Such was my heart, which thou didst pity even in that bottomless pit. Behold, now let my heart confess to you what it was seeking there when I was being gratuitously wanton, having no inducement to evil, but the evil itself. It was foul, and I loved it. I loved my own undoing. I loved my error, not that for which I erred, but for the error itself. A soul depraved, falling away from security in you to destruction in itself, seeking nothing from the shameful deed, but shame itself. That's a fascinating insight into why we do some of the sinful things we do. Augustine reflected on the days before his conversion and explained that he did not even love the thing, the pears, that he obtained sinfully. No, he loved the sin, doing the sin. He loved the sin itself for the simple fact that it was sin and he was wicked. And the point is that we see a similar occurrence in Micah 2. The, these oppressors, they don't even need more material goods. They love to store up all of it because they have the power to do so. And they are thrilled 
by the abuse of their power. Verse 1, I mean, it, it tells us that they lay awake at night plotting evil deeds, and they rush to enact their plans as soon as morning dawns. And verse 2 spells out these evil deeds and how they focus on taking property, taking goods, and taking money from those who are not part of the 1%. And this wickedness, though, is not even simply an oppression of the poor. Verses 8 to 9 make clear that the oppression happening here is not even focused just on the lowest social classes, but directed at every single person, everyone who is not the highest level of the upper class. If you read those verses with me, but lately my people have risen up as an enemy. You strip the rich robe from those who pass by trustingly with no thought of war. The women of my people you drive out from their delightful houses. From their young children you take away my splendor forever. We see that they take a rich robe from people passing by. The, I mean, the, the Hebrew here indicates that this, is a, this robe is a, is a nice kind of robe, and it is apparently something that the poorest people could not have owned. What makes this even more heinous is that the phrase who, in your, in your Bible it reads, who pass by trustingly with no thought of war, actually means who are passing by trustingly as they return from war. And what's going on here is the rich are literally stealing from soldiers who were away defending their people as they return to be happy at home. And further, these elitists evict women from their delightful houses, which indicates that these people have prospered during Judah's economic success under King Uzziah and have done well for themselves and had been able to build a decent home. The the upper tier evildoers, however, they had to have everything for themselves. And what we see happening here is it's It's almost not so much that they wanted more as they wanted everyone else to have less. The next problem addressed after the wicked social elites was the evil preachers who enabled them. Verses 6 and 7 make this clear. Do not preach, thus they preach. One should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. Should this be said, O house of Jacob, has the Lord grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? So Micah opened this second point of his sermon by quoting, or or at least imitating, other preachers who opposed his message. These other preachers tried, in verse 6, to silence Micah and other faithful preachers as they explicitly say, do not preach. They're wanting him to stop preaching that way. They, They gave the rationale that it's not good to preach about difficult things that make people uncomfortable because that might make the people of God look weird to the outside world. Wouldn't, one should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. They continue to argue, as verse 7 shows that that Micah's kind of preaching where he aggressively confronted sin should not even be used because God is love 
and other popular kinds of preaching help good people, after all. Should this be said, O house of Jacob? Meaning, should we even talk like this? Has the Lord grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? Well, we will come back to think about the details of this later, but, but we see in verses 3 to 5 and 10 and 11 that God's response to both these societal and theological lapses is that He is bringing judgment upon the whole people. Therefore, the upcoming problem, upcoming problems, it, are that personal and theological sin has provoked God's condemnation. And that brings us to our second point, the underlying premise. So the, the last point, trying to outline what was, what's happening in this text. And sometimes language in the prophets is not as direct as, as we might hope or wish. And we have to think a bit harder to see what the circumstances of the text are. And I hope it's clear enough now that the problems described here are that the social elite are greedy and abusing their power, and the religious establishment is preaching in a way that enables their behavior. And now I want to look at what likely motivates, or at least furthers, these issues, these problems. Now, we could, we could easily write both problems off to greed. The social elites want more material goods, and the degenerate preachers want to stay in prestigious favor. But I think that might be too simplistic. There does seem to be a bit more going on here. After all, we already looked at the example in Augustine's Confessions that I think draws out what's happening in the first couple of verses about how he pursued the sin not because he was directly greedy for the thing, but because he loved being wicked. And I've already pointed out that it's, that seems to be the case in Micah's day as well. There is an interplay here especially, but in life in general, which is where we're going, between that social wickedness of robbing from everyone who is not the upper class and that distorted preaching. It's, it's never easy, if, if it is possible, to know whether moral corruption is the cause of bad theology or if bad theology causes moral corruption. The two are so entangled with each other that it's more of a back and forth development than one simply leading into the other. Still though, we, we see here that the social elites have found for themselves clergy who will preach what they want to hear so that they can keep pursuing their sin. I, I would imagine that does not sound all that foreign to us. Does it? Are, are we not used to people telling us that they prefer a certain kind of preaching? That preaching just speaks more to what I need. And, and oddly enough, that preaching usually sounds something like, God wants you to be rich and have everything you want and just hope you're happy no matter what actions it takes for you to be happy. It's, it's the kind of preaching that enables people to say ridiculous things like, God told me to leave my wife for a younger woman. No. No, he didn't. It, it, it's funny, though, how, not in, the, not in the humorous sense, how we gravitate towards preaching that excuses and enables 
what we should not do, isn't it? On the other hand of this, the, the degenerate preachers criticized Micah for being too intense about castigating sin. They asked, should you really be preaching like that? I mean, God is patient. Come on, Micah. Have we run out God's infinite patience? Likewise, though, with this, are we not used to hearing popular preaching like this? Or at least responses to our preaching that sound just like this? I just prefer to focus on God's love. God is so loving. Would he really be angry with anything that I do? God is love. So should we not just focus on, focus on how much he cares for us? You're being way too serious, Micah. And it's the half-truths that swallow us whole into our sin. We should never doubt that God is love. I'm not trying to question that in the least. But we should also never doubt that God loves his own glory and pure righteousness more than he loves any one person. God does not let his love override his concern to uphold justice. God hates sin unchangeably. End of story. In his entire essence, he will not stand it. It is a fully heretical lie to think that God would be pleased with us even if we are totally in love with our sin, just because he is love. God's love also includes his love for good, which means if you are evil, then you are a child of wrath. We cannot stilt our message to one side and expect to preach anything that is meaningful. We, we have watched theological liberals do that for more than a century, and we have seen the moral fallout from that. We have watched them increasingly condone and endorse any and everything people desire to do using God's immense love as the reason why that is okay. Everyone's a sinner, and God loves sinners. So we should just keep on sinning, knowing that God loves us. Is there reasoning? God does love sinners, but God will not tolerate an unrepentant love for sin among those who claim to be his people. Verse 3 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, against this family I am devising disaster from which you cannot remove your necks, and you shall not walk haughtily, for it will be a time of disaster. So, just as the wicked have plotted disaster for those beneath their position, God plans disaster for them as recompense. Verse 10, arise and go, for this is no place to rest because of uncleanness that destroys with a grievous destruction. So because of their heinous actions, God is sending Judah into exile. The, the promised land was a place of rest, but God is upending that and telling them to arise and go, namely, into eventual, eventual captivity in Babylon. 
all because they sold out the truth for what they wish and diminished and distorted have truths that felt like what they wanted. And so, the practical question, to bring this home for us, the practical question is, how do we think about doctrinal preaching? Intense preaching that confronts sin. Does it frustrate you when we get really precise and even push back against other views? Do, do you wish we would just get on to practical things and help you feel better and scratch the things that are your own interests? Because that is the same approach that the preachers and hearers in Micah 2 had as well. We have to care about the big ideas. We have to care about understanding more and more about God because He is the one we worship and we need to know Him because it is in knowing His character that we know what pleases Him. The, the underlying premise of wicked practice is wicked doctrine announced by wicked preachers. That brings us to our third point, the undying promise. Okay, we, we've seen how bad the situation was in Micah's time. And we have looked at the foundations of those wicked practices and how they have resonance or echoes into our own day. And now we need to look at verses 12 and 13. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. He who opens the breach goes up before them. They break through and pass the gate, going out by it. Their king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. Okay, so despite the grave predicament in Judah, God still inspired Micah to tell of future salvation. God will be the shepherd to his people and gather them together. We have seen the situation in Judah was awful, and they would be sent into exile eventually. And this, this though, matches. If you remember back to last Sunday night, uh, this matches the same context we saw in the second half of chapter 1, where Samaria had already been captured, and Judah's doom was looming large. In verse 13... God promised that even though he was sending the Assyrian army to chastise them, he offered protection. So just as, so we read Isaiah 37, right? And it was a long chapter, but hopefully you remember some of what was going on there. And just as Isaiah described there, Assyria would traipse through the land of Judah, even though God would send them to do that, conquer so many cities, and God had appointed them for that, God would gather some to Jerusalem and would not let that city fall. He would go out and defeat his people's enemy as their king, as he did. 185,000 he destroyed. And this is a, verses 12, or yeah, verses 12 and 13 are a prophecy of that same event. Much shorter, obviously. But it's a prophecy about that rescue in that time and place. But just as Micah's indictments resonated into our time, so his promises of salvation ring forth for us too. God has always been the shepherd of his people. And you know where this is going, right? John 10 tells us 
Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came as the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep, his people. He will gather those whom the Father has given him to redeem. He is the king who has conquered even death when he died on the cross. And the offer of salvation remains even today for the godless. Because Christ died for his enemies that God might justify the ungodly. So if you're ungodly, the gospel promise is for you because Jesus Christ died to forgive you for being ungodly. To pay the death penalty that you owe for all of your transgressions and to earn the Holy Spirit that he might send it to you to walk with you in sanctification. And like God gathered Judah into Jerusalem, he gathers his people into the church here. He sets us in this place to be under the ministry of his word. And on the last day, he will return and will go forth as our king before us to claim this world as his kingdom. The gates of hell will never prevail against the church. And Christ is our king, ready to return on his steed to redeem his people entirely. The undying promise is that God saves his people through faith in his son. Let's pray.